We'd like to welcome everyone to the Cryosphere Pavilion. Uh, those of you who are here, you can start using your headsets right now so you can hear. This is Silent Theater. We would, um, my name is Pam Pearson. I'm the director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Uh, we're helping to organize this pavilion. We are also uh, delighted to welcome the Clean Arctic Alliance to the pavilion of which ICCI is a member. Uh, we would like to also welcome those of you who are listening today at the hubs in Geneva and Stockholm. Feel free to ask questions either in person or in the chat. Um, this is an incredibly important issue for the Arctic region, but not just for the Arctic region, for the entire world, because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And the impacts of shipping, although they are greatest on Arctic peoples and nations, are just as great on the rest of the planet. So this is really an issue for all of us and the need to decrease emissions and pollution and in particular black carbon and its impacts on Arctic sea ice is urgent and incredibly necessary. So I would like to turn over this event to uh, Dr. Sean Pryor of the Clean Arctic Alliance. Please. Thank you, Pam. Sorry, so many things to juggle here. Glasses, headphones. I'm told if I wear the headphones, they'll uh, reverberate and feed, give everyone feedback. So I'll, I'll try not to. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone for attending this afternoon. Uh, here in the Cryosphere Pavilion, but also those of you watching on live stream, wherever you are. Um, as Pam said, I'm Dr. Sean Pryor. I'm the lead advisor to the Clean Arctic Alliance. Uh, that's a coalition of 21 non-profit organizations. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to our event this afternoon, Reducing Ships Black Carbon Emissions to Protect the Arctic. Um, first, a couple of housekeeping uh, points. I think Pam's gone through most of this already, um, but just uh, to, to remind people that the event is being recorded and it will be publicly available afterwards. And please, especially those uh, watching on live stream, if you have any questions, please do submit them. Uh, we'll try and answer them at the end of the session. And of course, anyone here, please feel free to ask questions too at the end of the session. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes giving a little bit of background to the event. Um, around just nearly 11 years ago now, in fact, 11 years ago, pretty much, three countries, Norway, Sweden, and the United States, submitted a paper to the International Maritime Organization on the need to reduce emissions of black carbon from shipping in the Arctic. The paper alerted the shipping industry and IMO delegates to worrying realities. Black carbon emissions, especially when deposited on land and sea ice, are a significant contributor to warming and melting. The reductions in black carbon now, however, can provide an immediate and short-term climate response, and they are absolutely necessary to forestall a climate tipping point and to provide the climate breathing time that is needed before reductions in CO2 can take hold over the longer term. It also pointed out that black carbon will have positive effects on human health. And it noted that over short time periods, the impact of black carbon is especially severe. It's estimated that it causes around 680 times more warming than the same amount of CO2 over a 100 year period and 2,200 times more warming over a 20 year period. The three countries concluded by saying that because shipping traffic is expected to grow substantially as melting in the Arctic, as melting opens up sea lanes, that possible black carbon abatement measures should be examined, including switching to distillate, lighter distillate fuels and allowing the use of particulate filters. And it called on the IMO to take action. Where are we now 11 years on? The Arctic is experiencing historic changes. The Arctic Ministerial uh, earlier this year in Reykjavik, Iceland, announced that the Arctic is now warming more than th or three times as fast as anywhere else in the world. 
And it's now recognized that not only is it warming fast, but the shipping routes are becoming more and more feasible. The lanes are opening up and we've started to see shipping movements throughout the winter months. In fact, between 2015 and 2019, black carbon emissions from shipping in the Arctic increased by 85%. So at today's event, we hope what we're going to address is the Arctic cryosphere, the impact of black carbon, consequences for both local communities in the Arctic and for communities further south, and what can be done to reduce emissions of black carbon from shipping. It's hoped that the discussion this afternoon will not only contribute to COP26 this week and next, but also to a meeting that will be taking place at the International Maritime Organization later this month. We have five distinguished uh, speakers for you today, followed by some time for questions and answers. I'm going to turn to our first speaker, Professor Dirk Knotts, who is from the University of Hamburg Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. Dirk will be addressing, is this the end of the ice age? Over to Dirk. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, um, both Sean and both to all of you um, who are there on site or uh, online. Um, I can't really see you, um, but it's still good to, to know that you're out there. And what I would like to do over the next um, 10 minutes or so is to provide you with an update on where we stand regarding um, Arctic sea ice um, from the perspective of the most recent IPCC report, um, where I was a lead author on the um, chapter on ocean cryosphere and, and sea level. And just to remind you of um, the key finding of this report, um, and I'm sure you've all seen these, these graphs um, many times by now, but still to, to get the ball rolling, um, it is really clear that human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. And you see this um, very strong increase here um, in the warming rate um, of the past 150 years or so. And if we go to individual drivers of this warming, um, also from the most recent IPCC report, um, what is also clear is this um, quite important role of, of black carbon. Um, so what is shown here on the left is the total observed warming. Um, over the period 1850 to 1900 relative uh, to 2010, 2019. It's about 1.1 degrees warmer now than it used to be 150 years ago. If we take all the human drivers together, uh, we get as the best estimate roughly um, the same amount of warming, which is this left red bar here. Um, where And this constitutes of um, so about 1.5 degrees of warming from well-mixed greenhouse gases, which are partly compensated for by other um, human drivers, in particular aerosols. And if we go even further down and look in the individual drivers, uh, we find that, of course, most of the warming comes from the well-mixed greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. Um, but there's one over here, um, actually the fourth biggest driver of the warming, um, which is black carbon, and which is what we're talking about today. And as Sean just outlined, um, it looks small here, um, but the important point about black carbon is that it can be reduced very, very rapidly, and that these reductions will have an almost immediate effect um, on the global warming that we are seeing. And this is really just to put the black carbon um, discussion into some perspective of the other drivers of, of climate change. But our, our actual topic today is the loss of the ice that we have observed. Um, and I'm always stunned, really, if I look at the numbers of how much ice our planet has lost over the past year, um, 30 years or so. So what is shown here in these different colors um, is the evolution of um, ice mass on our planet since 1994, uh, roughly until today. Um, and what we find is that we've lost about 30,000 gigatons of ice, um, 30 trillion tons of ice since 1994. Um, and only the ice loss from Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets at the moment um, are more than that should have said um, billion tons, um, billion tons here um, per year. Um, whereas it used to be just 100 billion tons per year um, in, the, in the 1990s. And so it's a, um, it's a huge, huge amount of, of ice that we're losing from these um, ice sheets, 
which then of course give rise to some substantial sea level rise um, um, as is um, shown by these darkish colors here. However, what I would like to talk about today um, when it comes to shipping in the Arctic is the loss that we've seen in terms of Arctic sea ice, um, which is this um, darkish bluish area up here. We've really seen massive reductions over the past 30 years. And those become very, very obvious if we look down um, with a satellite on our planet. So this is how the Arctic Ocean looked like at the end of summer 1992. Um, so in summary, you have this reduction in the Arctic sea ice area um, down to the levels you've, you've found here um, when the Rio, um, the, the Earth Summit on Sustainability took place. And back then, at the end of summer, still the entire Arctic Ocean was covered in sea ice. So this is how the Arctic looked like 30 years ago when world leaders agreed that we will now all live sustainable and take care of our planet. Um, well, in what happened in reality, we all know, um, this is what was left in terms of Arctic sea ice in the year 2020, last year, at the end of summer. So in terms of area, the amount of ice that we've lo left here um, is about half of what it used to be 30 years ago. But these sea ice flows here on the Arctic Ocean are only about half as thick as they used to be. So in terms of overall volume, this is about a quarter um, of what we used to have about 30 years ago. And so the question, of course, then arises, um, will the Arctic or when will the Arctic look like this in summer? Um, basically an ocean without any, any ice left. Um, and the sobering finding of the IPCC report, and I'll come to that in just a moment, is that indeed um, we will most likely um, see such a largely ice-free Arctic, practically ice-free Arctic ocean before 2050 in just about every emission scenario that we think is, is feasible, including the very lowest one. And we see that um, not quite as clearly um, what will happen by 2050 in all the scenarios from this graph here, which shows um, model simulations um, used in the last IPCC report for the different scenarios. I would like to turn your focus to these bold lines here. Um, you can think of these as sort of how does the Arctic look like on average in different scenarios in a given summer. Um, this is the amount of CS we have here on the y-axis in the Arctic. This is the time here. And what we find is that by the end of the century, um, in the three highest scenarios that the IPCC examined, the Arctic will basically be ice-free in every single summer. It's the normal state that the Arctic is practically ice-free, with the boundary for practically ice-free being denoted here as less than one million square kilometers of Arctic sea ice. So that is what we call practically ice-free for um, all purposes that we can reasonably think of. And only in the two lowest scenarios where we actually manage to keep global warming well below two degrees, um, the normal state of the Arctic Ocean will still be that it's ice covered, but it will nevertheless be ice free at least in some years. This is what we find um, from the IPCC, uh, from the CMIP climate models. We find the same information um, if we look much simpler um, at observational records um, where we um, primarily look at how much ice do we have in the Arctic as a function of how much CO2 we humans have emitted. Um, if we plot these two data sets against each other, we find this very, very clear linear relationship um, with a slope of about three square meters of sea ice loss per ton of CO2 emissions, um, which basically allows everyone out there to calculate their own contribution to, to sea ice loss. Um, so if you emit per, per year, say, 10 tons of CO2, um, you melt ice flows the size of 30 square meters somewhere in the Arctic. And because we know from climate model simulations and from theoretical understanding that this will um, continue to hold this linear relationship, this then allows us to calculate at which amount of CO2 emissions the Arctic will start to become ice-free in September. Um, so what is shown here is cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions above present on this axis here. Here we have the month. Um, and so you can basically think of every ton of CO2 moving this bar to the right here um, until eventually um, at about 500 gigatons of CO2 emissions above present, because this paper is three years old, uh, we start to see the first ice-free month in the Arctic. And so this, these results are very consistent with what we find in the climate models. So we have various lines of evidence um, that the Arctic will become ice-free um, 
at around, say, 500 gigatons of CO2 emissions, future CO2 emissions, um, for the first time, um, and which then led us to conclude for the IPCC report um, that the Arctic is likely to be practically CS3 in September, at least once before 2050, under the five illustrative scenarios considered in this report, with more frequent occurrences for higher warming levels. And that is a very sort of, um, yeah, scientifically phrased um, finding of what the Arctic will look like in the future. But what it basically says is that for the very first time, we can now say with great certainty that it is too late to still protect one of the most amazing landscapes of our planet. That taking all the evidence we have together, um, we are quite certain that we will lose the Arctic Sea as at least in summer, and that it has now become too late um, to, to make that, um, sort of to rule out that, that possibility. It is not too late um, to still limit whether this loss will become the new normal or whether it will only happen in the very warmest summers. Um, so that we can still avoid. And so the future of Arctic sea has certainly still remains in our hands. But what the message that uh, I would like to really get across here is that we've warned for decades and decades that if we continue emitting CO2, we will eventually lose the Arctic sea ice cover in summer. And we can basically look at all the old IPCC reports. That relationship was very clear there. Um, and now in the most recent reports, we basically find that um, this is now something that we can no longer practically avoid um, because we've waited too long with substantial CO2 emissions. We are too close now to this point where the Arctic sea ice cover is gone. Um, and to me, this gives warning to many, many other um, systems also on our climate and our uh, climate system and many other parts of our climate system that eventually we will see more and more of these messages. It is too late to avoid some of the worst outcomes of global warming. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude this presentation. I thank you all for being out there for listening um, and I look forward to questions and lively discussions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Our second speaker today is Lisa Kopokwaluk, Vice President of International Affairs at the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Canada. Lisa's presentation is titled Black Carbon, Snow and Ice, Impacts in the Arctic and the Need for Global Partnerships. Over to you, Lisa. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, for, for this invitation uh, to speak at this event. And um, before I begin, um, I wasn't expecting all my friends to be here, but I would like to acknowledge uh, all my Inuit friends who are here, Peter Elner, knowledge holder, and a couple of uh, new people that I just met, my new friends who actually live in Scotland, and uh, Crystal, I believe I saw you. Yes, there you are. <laughs> and um, thank you for, for being here and supporting me. But um, I would like to uh, say um, uh, um, that uh, I'm really glad to be here to, to be able to talk to you about why it's so important that we talk about black carbon. I think we can take days and days and days to actually sit down together and, and talk about it. Uh, that's how important it is. Um, but I'm really glad for this opportunity. Um, I'm the Vice President International for the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Canada, and I'm from Pouvelnitur in Nunavik, which is in northern Quebec in Canada. I would also like to thank um, our Scottish hosts for welcoming us here and uh, for a lovely, uh, for a lovely place uh, to be and and to take part here at, at the COP26. Let me first tell you a little bit about who we are as Inuit. Um, we are an international people with one language, one culture, 
over 180,000 Inuit live in the circumpolar region. So we're talking about Inuit living in Canada, in Greenland, in Alaska, and Chukotka, Russia. And we live in four different political realities with different jurisdictions and various types of rules that we all need to deal with differently. So these lands together form Inuit Nunat. That means our homeland, Inuit homeland. And so while the Inuit population is relatively small in the global sense, the Inuit geographic presence is very large. Inuit Nunat is actually the size, about larger than the size of the European Union. If Inuit Nunat was a country, it would be the seventh largest country in the globe, just behind Australia and ahead of India. The Inuit Circumpolar Council is the international body which represents Inuit uh, from the Circumpolar region, and its mandate is to engage internationally on issues that are important to us. So, for example, language, education, health, wildlife management, marine mammals, the protection of the environment, and also ensuring that we participate in international fora such as this, the COP26. We hold our General Assembly every four years and discuss all the priority issues that we are facing. And we also celebrate our rich culture. The last General Assembly we had was in 2018 in Uqayakvik, which is also formerly known as Barrow in Alaska. There, Inuit leadership, elders and youth discussed our priorities and came up with a declaration that provides us direction. So that declaration, the Uqayakvik declaration, also included that we need to address the issue of black carbon. We are a marine people and we depend on the sea ice and the coastline for food security, transportation, and for the continued development of our culture. You know, in, in the summer, this past summer, I just went to my hometown to spend some vacation time. Last year, I couldn't because of the pandemic, as you know, I couldn't travel. We were not allowed to travel to our region because there are small remote communities. But why did I want to be there so badly? Because I was craving something. I was craving to go out on the sea to eat our fresh Arctic char, freshly caught. We love our fish, our Arctic char, and our caribou, our marine mammals, beluga, fresh. So we absolutely miss it sometimes. So that's what happened this summer. I just went phew, to spend some time with my family and to be out on the sea and camp in our ancestral lands, which are located on the Hudson Bay, the sea. So the impact of climate change um, increased shipping access to the Arctic and black carbon are among the many issues we are dealing with. You know, life has changed a lot for us in our homeland but we do continue to hunt and harvest and depend on the animals for food security. But we also depend on shipping for food and for supplies, other types of supplies, such as toilet paper and construction material to build housing. We also have, we order cars that come in through ships, computers, all sorts of things that we purchase from our local stores. So all other means of transportation are either impossible or just too costly. If we try to bring everything by airplane, it's too costly. By road, impossible because there are no road connections between our communities and the South. In addition, there's a, now a significant amount of mining 
and resource extraction occurring within the Arctic region. That forms an emerging part of the northern economy, which all requires shipping to move goods and, and uh, mineral ore uh, and resource extraction sites and uh, um, mining sites going back and forth from the north to the south. Inuit are also working towards conservation economies that protect the marine environments and our food security while supporting our remote economies. So our, our communities are interested in, in building our Arctic economies, but the protection of the Arctic marine environment and the animals that we depend on is critical. We absolutely need to protect our marine environment. Therefore, a safe and sustainable Arctic shipping fleet is a priority. There are many impacts from shipping to our animals, Underwater noise, grey water discharge, dumping at sea, the potential of heavy fuel oil spills that cannot be cleaned because we don't have the capacity nor the infrastructure to address any heavy fuel oil spills in our Arctic waters. It would be very difficult to clean right away. And then there's ice breaking that along with climate change is creating safety issues for our hunters. But today I'm speaking specifically to black carbon from burning heavy fuel oil in the Arctic shipping fleet falling on the snow and ice. Once deposited, as we learned, on the snow and ice, the black carbon absorbs more sunlight and this in turn increases snow and ice melt. It's a short-lived climate forcer. Black carbon in the Arctic comes from other sources as well. We depend on diesel-fueled generators in our remote communities to provide heating and electricity. And then there's municipal waste burning that happens. The burning of heavy fuel oil in shipping contributes up to 10% of global black carbon deposited in many coastal communities around the world. While Arctic shipping is currently a minor source of black carbon, it is projected to increase as shipping increases in the Arctic. And although we depend on shipping, the projected increase of shipping is really uh, concerning us. Our communities are all coastal and so most Arctic shipping operates close to the coast and in the margins of sea and pack ice. So black carbon is deposited near our communities and accelerates the loss of the ice, the snow, and the permafrost. Among many actions needed, reducing black car carbon emissions in the Arctic will have more of an immediate effect on the more warming of the Arctic than reducing long-term air pollutants. These are some images from various ice caps in Greenland and Canada showing the accumulation of black carbon. There have been many studies and organizations collecting data and on black carbon from NASA and the EU. The Arctic Council has been looking into this concern for quite a while now as well. And on top of all of this. <laughs> Inuit must be involved in research and the decision making with regards to what can be deposited in our Arctic and what we see as safe for our marine environment. What I'm saying is really important to us. We need to take part in decision making activities that concern our own homeland, our ice, our highways, our marine ecosystem. To this, ICC will learn this month if our application for consultative status at the IMO will be approved or not. There will be a meeting upcoming at the IMO and what we're hoping, if, if it's approved, that will give Inuit a voice at the highest levels of decision making on global shipping. It's clear from the data that black carbon is an issue in the Arctic 
and a concern for Inuit because as our sea ice melts from climate change and the Arctic shipping increasing, there will be more black carbon deposited, leading to more melt. We need to support the Arctic shipping fleet to transition to cleaner Arctic shipping fuels and reduce the black carbon in the Arctic. There are a number of policy tools um, that we uh, bring up here that could be proposed to address black carbon emissions in the Arctic. One is fuel switching, which would mean uh, for, for sh ships mandating fuel switching from HFO to distillate fuels while ships transit the Arctic region. This would reduce uh, the climate forcing overall of black carbon. The second is emissions control areas in the Arctic. As ships are passing through the Arctic waters, they follow regulations to reduce their emissions. They have the capacity to do that. But, but when they pass through the Arctic waters, they still are... Um, not uh, forced to do that, um, to, to, to reduce the emissions. Um, the Arctic is not a control area, is what I'm saying. So what we're saying is that it needs to become an emissions reduction area. Another, uh, uh, another um, uh, mitigation measure would be modern ship requirements. So uh, old ships should not be allowed to be passing through Arctic waters. Um, there's also um, uh, just not any ship in question that should be passing through the Arctic waters. And um, um, in Inuit Nunangat, there may also be other tools we can resort to. For example, there, are, there will be more and more uh, exploitation of mineral resources happening in the north. And in Canada, especially, we uh, in Nunavut and Nunavik and, and in the Inuvialuit region and even in Labrador, we have impact and benefit agreements with large mining companies that may want to exploit in our lands. And I believe we can use that as an opportunity to say to mining companies, if you want to mine and exploit in our area, your ships must uh, change their, their um, um, uh, fuel uh, transit into distillate fuels and not use heavy fuel oil in our waters. So that's another tool that I believe we could resort to. So um, I'm almost heading into my conclusion. <laughs> and... Um, there are also uh, partnerships and collaboration that uh, we have done in the past at ICC. And um, there was a one called Many Strong Voices in which we did some projects uh, with uh, Pacific communities. So um, highlighting the similarities and climate impacts. And we would like to reinvigorate these types of collaborations with communities uh, in the South and in the North. Because even though our realities are very different, I think um, mitigating climate change, ensuring that the impacts are much, much reduced, help protect both environments in the Pacific and in the Arctic. The coral and the ice, for example. So those are uh, important collaborations. There are a few references that if, or if you want, uh, we can share with you. And um, heading into my last points, um, we have a, a direct and strong interest in Arctic shipping. And we'll continue to work with industry and regulators to ensure safe Arctic shipping protocols mitigating the threats of spills and black carbon pollution and ensuring that our Arctic communities and ecosystems are healthy. We, as a last point, what I would like to say uh, as a main message is that 
Um, it all relates to our well-being, our mental health, our food security, um, and all of these relate to our indigenous rights, which are clearly outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So this is something that we really must keep in mind when we talk about um, finding ways to take action on reducing climate change, uh, ensuring that uh, the increase of temperature is, is controlled and does not go above 1.5 degrees. Um, we depend on the ice. It is our highway. And so uh, let's always turn back into indigenous rights. Uh, the Arctic is our homeland, and we want to ensure that it remains pristine, pure, so that we may remain in it. It is a place that we love, that it is a place that we want to protect. So I thank you for listening to me and uh, for this opportunity to have uh, said our piece at ICC. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to move straight on to our third speaker today, Major Siasi Kaho, uh, with the Tongan Embassy in London. And Major Kaho is going to speak on coral and ice, same world, same future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean, for that uh, introduction. Uh, uh, delegates to, to, to COP um, and our fellow um, speakers today, representatives of the Inuit Circumpolar um, Council, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I acknowledge with thanks the opportunity uh, and invitation from the organizers of this event, uh, in particular the Clean uh, Arctic Alliance, to speak on this important uh, theme of black carbon I would like to take a few moments to talk to you about coral and ice. I bring warm greetings from the Kingdom of Tonga and to provide a, a geographical picture, my country is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's made up of coral atolls with some 165 islands of which 36 are inhabited. Uh, but it's spread out over an area of over 650,000 square kilometers. That is where I call home. I also bring greetings from four other Pacific islands, namely the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the Solomon Islands. Together we form an informal block of collective sovereignties within the International Maritime Organization, with a common focus of getting the shipping sector to reach 0% gas house emissions by 2050 at the latest. Our peoples face existential threats that result from climate warming, including that caused by international shipping. These emissions predominantly come from large container shipping vessels and other large tonnage vessels that crisscross and traverse our oceans, carrying many of the items, goods and products that are sold and purchased here in European countries, uh, just amongst other places. I will elaborate on this aspect of my statement later, but please allow me to emphasize one particular aspect that attracted my interest to be part of this event. It is the cultural similarities that our people have in ecosystems that on the surface seem so far apart and yet, in essence, have a set of characteristic traits that are quite similar. <laughs> About coral and ice. Pacific Islanders live in harmony with their environment, and every day we interact with our environment almost as if we live together with other species and occupy these tiny specks of land in this vast ocean. We are peoples of the ocean, and when I say that, I'm not stating something out of the norm or trying to sweep you off your feet by making such bold statements. I make this statement as it is a fact. We are peoples of the ocean. 
like one famous author in the Pacific described Pacific Islanders as people with salt running through their veins. One other key element from our part of the ocean is that we use the same word to describe land and ocean and the placenta of a newborn child. And that word is fanua in my language. Or fanua, vanua, anua in other Pacific languages. For us in the Pacific, our ocean is very much part of our, our identity as Pacific Islanders. Coral for us therefore represents the base element of our character as Pacific Islanders. Hence for us in the Pacific Ocean, when our coral reefs begin to bleach and die from increasing acidity and warm temperatures, much like the communities in the Arctic suffering from disappearing ice, we feel like a part of us has died or disappeared. We have recently hosted an online discussion between governments and NGOs, actors on the coral and ice theme to express this linkage and shared challenge and to build momentum to secure high ambition outcomes at MEPC 77. And we are grateful to be invited onto this panel to reiterate and build on the event and our friendship with the Arctic, the Inuit Circumpolar Council and the Clean Arctic Alliance. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, time is not our friend. And we knew this before the IPCC published this AR6 report earlier this year. But with every passing IPCC report, the evidence only becomes more conclusive about how little time we have to act. This moment, this most recent work shows how we have at most 18 years before we exceed a critical threshold and guardrail for both Arctic and Pacific communities. The average temperature exceeding 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. This is why we strongly believe that we need to look not just at the well-known causes of climate warming, CO2 emissions, but every emission species that is responsible for climate warming and that needs to be managed. Black carbon, as estimated in the IMO's own fourth GHG study published in 2020, is indisputably a significant source of climate warming. In 2018, it is estimated to make up nearly 7% 7, 7 of shipping's total global warming potential. In 2018, it was 14 times more important to the 100-year global warming potential than methane, another important but as yet unregulated source of climate warming emitted by international shipping. But despite the fourth IMO GHD study finally recognizing the importance of black carbon, the regulation of black carbon at the IMO has been slowed down by process. We are therefore grateful to the leadership on this issue by the Arctic communities and the Clean Arctic Alliance and strongly support their proposal of a resolution for voluntary action that can reduce its emission to help slow the, the climate warming impacts. This must be just the first step to address the issue. Our preservation of coral and ice and the survival of our peoples and cultures needs more than voluntary action. To achieve this, we see strong potential for us to build stringent policies that can regulate fossil fuels, GHG emissions and pollutants. This is why Tonga is also supporting a second resolution at IMO MEPC 77, led by Kiribati, a commitment by IMO to reach zero GHG emissions by 2050. And it is why Tonga is strongly engaged in the efforts to secure the, ad the, ad the adoption and ambitious GHG controlling policies measures at the IMO. We are working with our colleagues in the Marshall Islands and the Solomon Islands, who have proposed a levy to be placed on GHG emissions from shipping, from international shipping. As the discussion progresses to the detailed design of that levy, we believe the levy and associated further policy measures need to be regulating all GHG and climate warming emission species to ensure we bring the regulation of black carbon into action taken by the IMO. The levy is a win-win policy solution and the only policy option 
under consideration at the recent IMO intersessional meeting on midterm policy that is both ambitious and equitable. The policy puts a price on GHG emissions, driving investment from fossil fuel production and use and towards shipping's future scalable zero emissions fuel. At the same time as disincentivizing the use of fossil fuel. The levy raises revenues which can be used both in sector to accelerate early adoption of the necessary long-run technology and new fuels that can control black carbon and all GHG emissions, as well as to support governments, especially those of SIDS and LDCs, in more general mitigation and adapt adaptation efforts. Tonga is dedicated to working at the IMO to find multi multilateral consensus and wide buy-in to equitable solutions for its shared uh, problems. We were therefore delighted to see the announcement by 50 of the world's most climate vulnerable countries, the DACA Glasgow Declaration launched earlier this week at COP, and that they explicitly supported the Pacific's call for the IMO to unambiguously align with efforts not to exceed the 1.5, as well as expresses their support for an ambitious and equitable levy. This wider support from the global south for the critical important climate issues under debate at IMO is an important new development. We must now ensure the CVF support is expressly direct, directly in the policy discussions at the IMO and builds further momentum for the on, ongoing negotiations. Thus Tonga will work tirelessly with other like-minded high ambition countries to help make sure this happens. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, if there is one thing we learned from COP26 and other multilateral spaces, it is the need for these relationships between our peoples to become the basis of agreements and common ground in moving forward. Building on shared bonds, we have established around the in interlinked challenges of preserving our coral and their ice. We are fully supportive of the aspirations of the ICC within the IMO to be acknowledged as, as a member in its own right and we will push together with our Pacific bloc to make it a reality. And we are committed to work ambitiously together with them on to control black carbon and GHG in that forum. I thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Wow, 18 years. It's not very long, is it? And that doesn't mean 18 years to wait. That's 18 years in which we need action to make sure that we don't exceed 1.5. For anyone born this year, that's their childhood. That's how long it is. Um, our fourth speaker today is uh, Dr. Richard Hickson, consultant in critical care and co-founder of NHS Ocean. Richard's going to tell us a bit more about human health care and the oceans. So I'll hand right over. Thank you, Sean, and thanks very much for the invite to uh, speak today. Um, I just want to start really by, by thanking a couple of people who have been with me on this journey over the last 18 months um, in the oceanic and human health sphere. Uh, I'd like to thank Georgie Soman, Laura Fleming, Kat Smith, and also Rick Fordham, um, who have worked tirelessly over the last year or so to bring this very important topic into our consideration. I'd also like to thank, if my family are actually dialing in, to thank them also, because they've actually put up with my absence for the last years I've been working in this area. I'm a critical care consultant, so basically it's been a kind of busy year in the middle of a global pandemic, and this has added to that workload, and they've been incredibly tolerant. So it was during this year that I really started thinking about this, about the fact that as a critical care doctor, I was using a lot of stuff. I use a lot of consumables, and these uh, are in the form of pharmaceuticals and equipment. And I also produce a lot of pollution, molecular and macro pollution. I became really interested in just kind of understanding 
what the impact of this procurement of stuff was, especially on the oceanic environment, which is just an area that I have been interested in since being a child. So I kind of started with a bit of a question and I, I kind of wanted to know how, how can we ensure human health care and our suppliers started thinking about oceanic health. This wasn't just out of curiosity. This was because I knew as an amateur ocean enthusiast that the oceans were at risk. So I wanted to create an action. To me, this was an absolute no brainer. I knew about pro primary oceanic production. I knew about the fact it delivered food uh, for the planet. I knew about it producing oxygen. It provides transportation, livelihoods, medicines, health and well being. It was an amazing sink for the energy that we're producing through global warming. And obviously, it provides carbon sequestration. So how do I make human healthcare care about oceanic acidification, hypoxia, warming, and pollution? How do I get Global Goal 14 written into green plans at national level, regional level, and local level? We're a land-based species. What we see every day is usually land-based. We become ill on land and we receive our health care on land. And this creates a unique challenge. So I needed some words. I needed something that captured the essence of what I was trying to achieve and the message I was trying to get across. So here I've paraphrased Sylvia Earle, the oceanographer, in the very simple statement, no blue, no green, no life. I knew that if oceans became toxic, this was going to impact upon human health and well-being. And there was a link. I also knew that the time scale was incredibly short with business as usual, as estimated by the Ghost Foundation, leading to, leading to the critical point of loss of carbonate based life forms by about the early 2040s. So this is a very, very short time scale at which to raise this and to act. I'm now going to borrow a phrase that originated in Newcastle, England, from James Dixon and his team there. The climate emergency is a health emergency, and there's been a strong healthcare theme running through this conference, and rightly so. Climate change leads to a number of health challenges. The trauma from adverse weather events, drowning from flooding, new and existing infectious diseases becoming more prevalent, the interruption to food supplies. We stop producing new medicines that do come out of the ocean as well, and there's the impact on mental health and well-being, which can be considerable, of all these uh, human health challenges. And there is also air pollution as well, which kills 40,000 people in the UK alone and millions worldwide. And black carbon is part of this problem. But it's not just a health problem. It is a health care problem. Health care is not benign. It produces globally 5% of our CO2 emissions and a massive amount of pollution. So the more climate change affects human health, the more healthcare we have to provide. This fuels climate change, which affects human health, and the more healthcare we have to provide. We end up in a positive feedback loop that is extremely dangerous, and we have to break that loop. We've only got two ways to break that loop. One is we do it intentionally through changes, such as what can fall out of COP26. The other is it breaks healthcare, and then we can no longer provide healthcare to individuals or their loved ones. Our supply chains are absolutely instrumental for the delivery of human health care. 80% of our NHS goods arrive on container ships. Our supply chains account for 62% of our NHS CO2 emissions. It's the greatest area of opportunity, but also challenge. Even if we hit an absolute maximum of repurposing and reusing products, we will still need international supply chains absolutely no doubt about it. So we have to get to grips with this now. And we know that the ships that travel on our oceans cause harm. They cause carbon harm to the tune of about a billion tons of CO2 every year. And they cause non-carbon harm, other emissions, nitrates, sulfates, volatile organic compounds, black carbon. We have non-carbon harms in the form of marine mammal collisions oceanic noise, pollution, and transfer of invasive species, all of which harm our ecosystems and therefore harm humans ultimately. And we need education. And this is really tough because even with the NHS net zero plans in place and been in place for over a year, only about a quarter 
of UK healthcare professionals are aware of NHS England's net zero plans. So how do we get oceans in there as well? If we can't actually crack the education of our own workforce, then getting oceans in there as well is even more of a challenge. This is a work in progress. The education is ongoing, but it does just illustrate the challenge that we face and the timescales involved. And whatever actions we take, they have to be biosphere focused. They cannot just be land focused. We see land every day, we breathe the atmosphere, but oceans have to be included in this strategy because oceans are amazing. 70% of the Earth's surface, 97% of its water, 80% of all living organisms. As we've heard, it absorbs over 90% of the planet's excess heat. It produces 50% of the Earth's oxygen and absorbs 25% of our excess CO2. The oceans hold 40 trillion tons of carbon. That is 16 times more than land and 50 times more than the atmosphere. So I started to think about how we could get oceans linked in with human healthcare strategy. And my thoughts were on one side, we have the providers of healthcare. In this situation, or in this slide, sorry, we have the NHS. And on the other side of the equation, we have our suppliers. We have 80,000 suppliers, which are global. This is Fisher & Paykel in New Zealand. I picked it because it's the furthest away, but also because they are one of the real early adopters of sustainable supply chain practices. In the middle of this, we have the container shipping industry, and these obviously sail on our seas and impact, as I've described. These are the lifeblood of human healthcare. But what we need to do is we need to join forces with these industries. We need to bring them closer together because we need our healthcare services and our suppliers to be showing the container shipping industry that we understand the impacts, that we care about these impacts. And together in a collaboration, we can move forward. We can nudge these incremental improvements in shipping, which will improve oceanic and therefore human health. We have three really key documents within the NHS. The first is the amazing Greener NHS Net Zero uh, report, which came out October 2020. Nick Watson and his team have done an incredible job in progressing this agenda. We have amazing progress within human healthcare that will yield dividends. Even in the first year, we are seeing measurable results. We then have policy procurement note 620, and this starts to bring in our ecosystem angle with respect to our supply chains. Through UK contracts, we are, we are actually uh, we, we are, uh, asked to influence suppliers through the delivery of the contract to support environmental protection and improvement. Now, this is fantastic because if we can write this into our healthcare asks of our suppliers, then we have something targeted at net zero, and then we have something targeted at ecosystems. And then we have the amazing soon to be published Evergreen Supplier Framework from Priya Bailey and Alex Hammond's team at NHS England. And this is where this all starts to consolidate. We get the supplier framework in place. We ha suddenly have this absolute clarity of the asks of our suppliers and they can progress up these rankings within the framework as their ambition and their delivery becomes more and more obvious and they therefore qualify these higher tiers within the framework and they are looked upon favorably from the perspective of supplying goods to the health service. The first action which we are really hoping to get into this framework is very shipping and oceanic based. So I've worked on this uh, this ask with Catherine Palmer from Lloyd's Register. And it's a very simple yes, no, or don't use ships answer. So does your organization use externally verified environmental performance data when selecting a carrier for your goods? That's the first ask. Now the Evergreen Supplier Framework is going to be a work in progress from January 2022 onwards. And we are hoping this is the first of many that are fo focused on oceanic health. Firstly, through the shipping steps and then through some ecosystem improvement and protection steps. Forward thinking suppliers and carriers will benefit the most. The NHS has huge buying power. It's an enormous organization and globally healthcare is worth over $12 trillion and is a global industry as is the shipping industry. So there are some amazing synergies here. From an ocean's perspective, I believe human healthcare can, tap, can address this in three different ways. One is container shipping, which I've talked about. The second is molecular pollution. And this is something we're only starting to explore. The presence of forever chemicals, pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical metabolites and microplastics in our oceanic ecosystem harms the ecosystem. 
And this is really important to recognize and to actually study further and to come up with some mitigation strategies. Because if we harm these ecosystems, it's not just dam damaging to the biosphere itself, but it actually reduces the ability of these ecosystems to sequester carbon. And if that's the case, what we may find is we focus on net zero, but because our, our natural processes become destroyed within this period, that actually the, the finish line just disappears over the horizon, however close we get to it. So molecular pollution is extremely important to bring into our thought processes. We also need to re-examine how, as humans, we relate to the ocean, how we understand the co-benefits of humans respecting the ocean, not just for oceanic benefits, but in order to improve human health and well-being. We are here to advocate for the oceans in human healthcare strategy. We're here to give oceans a voice at national and international level from a human healthcare perspective. We want to educate and communicate, and that is what we have been doing tirelessly for the last year. And we want to form a collaboration across this supplier, provider, carrier axis, all working together for the benefit of the supply chain's human health and the planet as a whole. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Richard. A lot of food for thought there. Our fifth and final speaker this afternoon is Dr. Brian Comer, who is the Marine Program Lead with the International Council on Clean Transportation. Brian's presentation this afternoon will address black carbon and shipping, trends and policy options to protect the Arctic and the planet Great. And now we've got Brian on the screen too. Brian, if you're there ready, the Thank you, Sean. Today I'll discuss black carbon emissions from ships, including trends and policy options to protect the Arctic and the planet. I'll begin by explaining uh, recent trends in black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic and globally. I'll then describe the impact of IMO's Arctic heavy fuel oil ban on black carbon emissions. I'll describe the emissions reduction potential of switching from residual fuels to distillate fuels, like um, And I will uh, explain the additional benefits of switching to distillates and end with some conclusions. Black carbon is not only a climate pollutant, um, but as we just heard from Richard, it's also a health hazard. The solid particles that ships emit, which includes black carbon, are estimated to cause more than 6,000 premature deaths in the Arctic front, which is the area above 40 degrees north latitude each year. The ICCT estimates that ships emitted 1,450 tons of black carbon above 59 degrees north latitude in 2015, and about 200 of that was emitted inside of what the IMO defines as the Arctic, which is shown in the uh, dark blue outline on the map. Unfortunately, black carbon emissions have increased in recent years. The left panel shows how much black carbon was emitted just within the IMO's definition of the Arctic and just from heavy fuel oil fueled ships. And it shows a 72% increase between 2015 and 2019. The middle panel shows black carbon emitted from all fuels by ships in the Arctic, including those that are running on heavy fuel oil and distillate. And it shows that total black carbon emissions in the Arctic grew 85% between 2015 and 2019, as Sean mentioned at the opening of this event. And we can compare that to the global increase in black carbon emissions from ships on the right-hand side, which was just 8%, uh, an important increase. But as we can see in the Arctic, emissions from ships of black carbon have increased 10 times faster than the rest of the world. You may have heard that the IMO is banning heavy fuel oil in the Arctic. And in theory, this should reduce emissions because using distillate fuels results in fewer black carbon emissions than using heavy fuel oil. But the ban, which begins three years from now, 
only applies in the IMO's definition of the Arctic. And ships built after August 2010 are exempt for five years after that. And Russia, the United States, Canada, Norway, and Denmark are all allowed to grant five-year waivers to their ships in their waters. And so um, this means that the Arctic heavy fuel oil ban that IMO agreed to won't really come into full effect until the middle of 2029. This slide shows a map of 2019 Arctic heavy fuel oil use on the left. And on the right, it shows how much heavy fuel oil would remain under the ban if it had been implemented back in 2019. And as you can see, there's hardly any reduction in the amount of heavy fuel oil that's used in the Arctic. And this is uh, thanks to the exemptions and the waivers that I just mentioned. And in fact, because of those exemptions and waivers, the heavy fuel oil ban will actually allow three quarters of the HFO fueled fleet to continue to use HFO. And so as a consequence, our research found that the IMO heavy fuel oil ban only really reduces the amount of heavy fuel oil that's carried as fuel on board the ships by 30%. And it only lowers the amount of heavy fuel oil that's used by ships in the engines by 16%. And it means that uh, over, overall, the impact of the ban will reduce black carbon emissions by just 5%. So not a large impact at all on black carbon emissions. One immediate way to reduce black carbon emissions is for ships that use residual fuels like heavy fuel oil to switch to distillates. According to, according to our research, if uh, the Arctic ships that use heavy fuel oil switch to distillate, their fleet-wide black carbon emissions would be reduced by 44%, which I show on the left. Because some ships in the Arctic are already using distillates, if you switch the heavy fuel oil fueled fleet to distillates, this reduces the total black carbon emissions emitted by ships in the Arctic by 30%. And there's additional benefits to switching to distillates. First, using distillates reduces air pollution, which has benefits for human health. Second, using distillates allows ships to run their exhaust through diesel particulate filters or electrostatic precipitators. These are technologies that reduce black carbon emissions by more than 90%. And lastly, using distillates eliminates the risk of a heavy fuel oil spill, which Lisa mentioned earlier, and also lowers the potential spill costs. To conclude, black carbon is a climate pollutant and a health hazard. Black carbon emissions from ships are glow growing globally and even more rapidly in the Arctic, 10 times faster. IMO's heavy fuel oil ban will reduce Arctic black carbon emissions by only 5% until exemptions and waivers expire in 2029. And it's important to know that countries are not required to honor the exemptions and the waivers that IMO has agreed to in their waters. And so the Arctic countries could require ships to switch to distillates when they operate in waters under their jurisdiction. Switching from HFO to distillates would immediately reduce black carbon emissions. And as Dirk mentioned, that has immediate climate benefits. And switching to distillates has the added benefits of lowering air pollution, uh, enabling the use of exhaust gas after treatments, and then also lowering the spill costs in the event of a, a fuel spill. And I'd like to end by emphasizing that later this month, the IMO's 77th Marine Environment Protection Committee will be uh, considering a resolution that calls on ships to voluntarily switch to distillates in the Arctic. This could provide um, an immediate benefit because um, the ships that did choose to, uh, to switch, even if they're not required to, would be reducing the amount of black carbon that's emitted directly in the Arctic. Ships are the only source of black carbon that is emitting black carbon as it's actually very close to the sea ice or in some cases breaking through the sea ice. So that could have a, a large and immediate uh, benefit. And so, um, 
We will see if MEPC 77 can muster the courage to pass this resolution. Thank you very much. Be done in five years' time or ten years' time. It could be done immediately by simply switching fuels making a different choice in terms of your fuels. What also horrifies me is that what we're asking is for ships or, or the shipping industry to move to something that we're trying to move away from when we talk about land-based transport, because it's still not great. But shipping at the moment is allowed to use something that is not allowed on land because it is so polluting. Anyway, um, that's the end of our presentations. We've got a few minutes left, I believe, yep. Four minutes, I think, from Heidi. Um, are there any questions? And do we have any questions come through on the live stream? Nope. <laughs> are there any questions uh, anyone would like to ask? If you can direct a question to somebody, please, please do. Uh, I have a very basic question. So has the railway transport been ever considered? And uh, what are the drawbacks? And assume the engineering could be like accomplished. Sorry, so the question is, could you just repeat the question? Yeah, has quite... railway transportation, just a railroad, has it been considered as a form of clean transportation? As an alternative, alternative to, shipping. to shipping, yes. I'm not in a position to answer that. Does anybody have an answer? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I know that in Canada there was a consideration to to add railroad uh, um, through Churchill, Manitoba. Uh, it was an old railroad system already, but they wanted to redevelop it, but only to add it into an existing maritime transport system. Yeah, that's the only thing I know. Perhaps there, someone else uh, can pitch in about that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I don't have a full answer, and I'm sure we can come back to you. I know that railway systems are con being considered alongside shipping. Ah, oh, excellent. Brian, do you have... Thank you. Thank, thanks, Sean. I also just wanted to point out that in the Arctic, a lot of the shipping activity is associated with oil and gas development and mining. And so um, if they're extracting the oil and gas uh, and trying to transport it, um, there's economies of scale with the large ships that are being used. And so the, the consequence is not only environmental, but also logistical and also um, economic. And of course, we also have um, a large amount of fishing activity in the Arctic. And so um, those ships would be catching uh, catching the fish and then transporting them. So they'd be burning fuel while they're doing that. Although uh, most of the fishing fleet is actually already operating on distillate fuels. It's really the oil tankers, uh, the bulk carriers, and the general cargo ships that need to be converted from heavy fuel oil to distillates. And coincidentally, those are the ship types that benefit the most from the exemptions and waivers. So I, I, th I think in terms of the answers that railway needs to be considered as part of the solution, but it's not ever going to be the whole solution, certainly. Do you want to? Hi there, I'm Lesa Kamanuk. I'm from Pond Inlet, Nunavut. And I'm, I live in Edinburgh, but Pond Inlet is um, one of the communities that is looking at a railway. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Arctic. Pond Inlet has the highest, um, highest iron ore. So the communities are in the process of talking about a railway. However, keeping in mind that the presentation that Lisa had mentioned is a lot of our food source is also from the land. And it's a huge conflict between the communities as well as the cost. So it's it seems like a way, however, it also impacts a lot of our day-to-day -day things. And when you think about the Arctic, the only way to the Arctic is flying. 
So there's no transportation. There's no way where you can take a boat or a snow machine. A lot of the times they do still do travel from community to community, but realistically, I'm not sure. It's a huge conflict now because a lot of these areas are our calving grounds for animals that the, a lot of the people still consist of. So it's it's a legitimate question, but whether or not is it doable? Our issues are more the permafrost is melting and all that sort of thing. But I just wanted to mention that is a great question, but financial wise, I'm not sure how easy that would be. And to support the communities that do live in the areas that it impacts our day to day lives and who we are and how we can represent that. So I just wanted to mention that when I heard that. So thank you. Thank you. I, th I think that's really helpful as well. And I, I, you know, my, my take on it at the end of the day is that not only do we need to look at each individual sector and moving them to cleaner and, and more renewable types of fuels and methods of propulsion, but we also need to look at transport as a whole and, and look at the balance between different types of transports. Any other questions? Go ahead. Hi there. My, uh, my question is Dr. Hickson. Um, so I'm a fellow NHS worker um, and I have a question about, uh, you know, has equipment, you know, green equipment, plastic, um, healthcare uh, procurement, is, is that something that's been brought in? So every day, obviously, like we use gloves, we use, um, obviously things need to be sterile. So are there companies out there that are, are looking to more sustainable solutions? Uh, because I, I'm chucking away loads of plastic every day uh, on a daily basis. So I, I wondered if that's been being addressed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the simple answer to that is, uh, is yes. And uh, I'll just, uh, I'm wearing one example here. So I'm wearing a washable uh, face mask from Revolution Zero from Tom Dawson's team there. This is constantly being discussed, the circular economy, about once products get into our healthcare system, they stay in the healthcare system. We have to balance the risks of things such as uh, infection prevention and control versus the very now well appreciated damages to the ecosystem. So I think we are going to see a very big shift in what how we procure and use items in future, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think our time is up, unfortunately, this afternoon. If there are any more questions, feel free to approach us afterwards and in the sidelines. Uh, and if they're directed towards Brian and, and Dirk, I'm sure we can redirect them to you. I think today's presentations have really highlighted the urgent need for action to reduce black carbon emissions from ships and also, I believe that this is action that we can or should be taking now. We know how to make this happen. We don't need new technologies. We don't need new methodologies or new practices. We simply need to scale up what is already possible and what is already beginning to happen. But it has to be done simply, quickly, and relatively cheaply. The Arctic doesn't have another decade to wait for action to reduce black carbon emissions from any sources. And if we are to be on the right side of the global climate crisis, we really need to take action now. We have that opportunity, not just here, uh, but has been mentioned by, by some of our speakers as well, at the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, in about two, two and a half weeks time, when there will be action to consider a resolution on black carbon and a resolution on high ambition in terms of carbon emissions uh, in their entirety. I'd just like to take this final opportunity to thank all of our panelists today, Dirk, Lisa, Major, Coho, uh, Richard, and Brian. And also, I'd like to thank you, the participants as well, for joining us today. And finally, I'd just like to thank ICCI, who have helped us to hold this event here today and, and really to make it a, a great success. So thank you, everyone. And if you've got any more questions, please do come and approach us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.